Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. Life has always been difficult for migrant farm workers. Now, though, it's almost impossible. Montage takes the want ads and goes job hunting. And Senator Lawton Childs talks about Uncle Sam helping out with the refugees, El Salvador and Cuba. This is Montage. Hello, I'm Joe Abril. The desperate needs of migrant farm workers in Florida have not diminished, especially in the agricultural counties like Palm Beach. But unfortunately, government interest in their plight is fading. Nancy Ross focuses on a migrant relief group that's struggling for funds. Palm Beach County is the crown jewel of the Gold Coast and a national symbol of upper crust wealth and beauty. It's a pastel colored playground where the privileged practice the art of living well in magnificent homes with dreamy names. But this is Palm Beach County too and the houses don't have names. Most don't even have addresses. And these are the farm workers, the poor relations who live around the corner from Easy Street, aliens in their own environment. <laughs> Thanksgiving Day, 1960. These are the scenes that shocked America as the best-fed people in the world sat down to enjoy the grandest feast of the year. Thrust before them, probably for the first time, were the miseries of Palm Beach County migrant farmers, the gypsy families that followed the sun to pick the national harvest while they themselves died on the vines. Epidemics of illness, poverty, employer abuse, and substandard housing were major concerns 22 years ago. The misfortune of this population has only gotten worse in two decades. The farm workers are third and fourth generation black, Puerto Rican, and Mexican Americans, and separate from the current refugee tide. Their largest source of assistance is the South Palm Beach County Migrant Coordinating Council, founded just three years ago. The council possibly reaches five of 55,000 migrants still working Palm Beach soil. The services the council provides is transportation. Uh, we have an emergency fund. Uh, in the event individuals might need emergency uh, services, uh, we have uh, food that we provide the people. Uh, we handle mental health problems if we uh, uh, have individuals who might need that service. Ernesto Gonzalez oversees a staff of five social workers who were given just under $100,000 to operate in 1980 and again in 1981. But what the county giveth, the county taketh away, and this year that grant was sliced in half. So I think uh, progressively now we've begun to see a decrease because of uh, the migrant uh, programs and migrants being seen as a singular entity but not yet recognized as an entity. They're recognized as being a part of, quote-unquote, the poor. And as long as there is not a visible uh, group of people or a, a voice that's vocal enough to call attention to the plight of migrants, that's going to continue to decrease. The result of the drastic cutback was the council's decision to go full steam ahead for six months. That six months ends in two weeks, and so will all the vital services migrants have come to rely on. Betty Escamilla is a council staffer and a migrant missionary. She visits about ten families each day, bringing food, clothing, and concern. In this van owned by the council, Betty will take migrants to health and welfare centers, and in a few days she'll make follow-up house calls. Migrant shacks don't have telephones. The squalor of this scene is typical. Maria Gonzalez lives here with her nine children aged 2 to 15 years. The toilet hasn't worked in two months, adding to the stench of the closed quarters. Maria pays $200 a month rent, but in migrant world there are no leases, and she realizes her family could be evicted at any time. Housing is one of the biggest problems and we are awfully frustrated due to the fact that uh, even Palm Beach County needs the farm workers. There is no government uh, regulations or provisions that will assist the farm workers in getting decent housing. I think as long as people are quote unquote called migrant, that emphasis on housing is going to remain the same. Farm workers don't feel, or farm owners rather, don't feel a tremendous obligation to provide adequate housing for folks who are not going to be with them year-round. 
Back at Maria's house, the refrigerator doesn't work either, not that it really matters. It's been three weeks since she's had money to buy food. The family now exists on donations received from the council. The children have been treated for malnutrition, only one in a host of medical problems rooted in migrant life. Well, there certainly is a high um, incidence of tuberculosis and venereal disease, um, and, and we depend on the Migrant Coordinating Council certainly to transport these people here and help them get care. Alcoholism is by far the big medical problem and generally blamed on the crew chief. He's the landowner's ally who supervises the workers. Out on the field, he may sell gallons of wine to the migrants on credit and for profit. It's a cheap, fast-acting anesthetic to thinking about problems. The crew chief is also named as a powerful figure in preventing labor unions from ever forming in the county. I don't say that all crew leaders are bad, but many of them will have the tendency of not doing enough for the worker and perhaps exploit them. Intimidation? Perhaps harassment, lack of uh, a good attitude by crew leaders and employers towards the worker. Those are the factors that I consider the reason why this has not happened in Florida. Education is another obstacle. People like to say the greatest hope for a better migrant future lies in the children. But the reality is that it's hard, if not impossible, to keep a migrant child in one school for very long. Education usually ends at eighth grade, and that leaves the children to fend for themselves in the isolation that's the most striking trait of migrant life. With all the different languages and cultures, the fly-by-night campsites are hardly communities. Migrants simply have to relate to their individual plight. When we send a child this way, and a father that way, and a mother someplace else, we are totally disrupting that, like that family's life for most of the day. And in the evening times, if they're coming back to a situation that's entirely deplorable, uh, there's very little the family can do other than try to get some rest, some sleep, and look forward to the next day's work. But the bottom line, of course, translates into dollar signs. Although there's an obvious right and wrong side of the tracks in this county, there's also a movement beginning among county leaders generous in their wealth and spirit. Don Capron began donating to charities like most Palm Beach success stories, at Christmas and Thanksgiving, the times of the year when it does the wealthy conscience most good. But he got hooked on the migrants' myriad of problems and the need of the coordinating council especially to continue its work. They need more than just transportation to get to a doctor. After they get to the doctor, there's got to be somebody there that can interpret. They need, um, there's no census. They have no addresses. Um, in fact, some of them, the crew chiefs have applied for up to six social security cards. They don't even have names. The only census that there is is really in the, in the head of Ernesto Gonzalez. Capron has succeeded in building a base of individual support and is now at the threshold of approaching major corporations like IBM for contributions. He's also working toward getting the council and so the migrants recognized in their own community and registered with civic organizations like United Way. I think most people are absolutely in sympathy with the idea of bringing back to the community the responsibility for taking care of the people in the community. But we're better off here than building a gigantic bureaucracy in Washington. Washington may have dealt a stingy hand this year, but the blame of 50 years past can't be put wholly on the federal government. The bad budget news for 82 might have a silver lining in Palm Beach if Don Capron's small but determined army of the wealthy can persuade their own to extend their sights past estate walls. Well, as you can see, the needs are many. If you can help the council assist in any of them, we'll be giving you a number to call at the end of the program. Are you out of work? If the answer is no, then count yourself among the lucky ones. More than 54,000 people are out of work in Dade County alone. And in this report, Ed O'Dell looks at the unemployment statistics and some of the people who are represented by those numbers. Most of us go ahead and come to school for four years so that we'll be better prepared and we have that competitive edge on someone else and well we have a four degree and we're prepared for this job and when you go ahead and you graduate and you say well I've got my four year degree I, I'm going to go ahead and get a job there's no job for you and you kind of say well what am I going to do. 
Go to school, get ahead, words that have propelled many young people into America's universities. These University of Miami seniors are no different. The problem is that many of the plans of students and people who are already in the job market are being shattered by the escalating national unemployment rate, which has now reached 9%. With many companies cutting back or going out of business, even people with good educations are having a tough time finding work. I've interviewed with a few companies, and these companies are not really looking for somebody necessarily to hold the positions, but trying to keep good relations with the school, more or less. Just about everybody I've talked to is in more or less the same boat. They're just, the jobs just are not there. If they can't obtain a job right now, they'll go to graduate school, wait two years, postpone that job search in hopes that the job market is going to open up more. They're very sensitive to the difficulties of finding a job now. They, they look around them, they see older people working in places like McDonald's and Burger King's, jobs that used to be held by young people. Now there are older people holding those jobs. They're sensitive to this and aware that it's going to be a tough road. 152 to station H, please. 152, 153. Offices like this may very well be America's melting pots. They are all here together, the black, the white, Latin, Haitian, young and old, and ex-students. This is the state of Florida's unemployment compensation office. The out-of-work queue here for hours in search of benefits. Jose Hernandez, Bobby Medina, Franklin Johnson. For every name, there is a different story. You've heard them all before laid off because of a slump in the housing market, relocating from northern states which are in worse shape, living with parents to get by, lives in limbo or headed for disaster, families to support, and so on. In February, there were over 6,500 new claims filed at this office. Now, prior to coming back to our office, we would like for you to register with the Florida State Employment Service. That's right upstairs, right here in the same building, room 280. Okay, when you go there, their job is to help you find a job, okay? When you are unemployed, one of the first things you do is learn to wait. Wait to get benefits downstairs, wait to find out what is or is not available at the employment office, and wait for a job. Okay, I have a lady here. She's been a uh, sleeve setter, a uh, single needle and she's worked at the same place for nine years. So I want to send her out. Her name is um, Andina. Andina Hernandez. Andina Hernandez is lucky. Well, in a way, she is unlucky because she did get laid off from a job she held for nine years. Unlucky again because her new job will pay less than the $5 an hour she made before. But lucky because her wait was short. She just got laid off the week before. They need five single needle operators with at least 24 months experience. Well, you've had, you've had nine years. And they will pay whichever you whichever is the greater. The piece work, all of course, you know, sewing machines all meant 30. Just how do you find a job these days? Traditionally, the use of the job section of the classified pages with the door-to-door -door method has always been a good place to start. And indeed, many people will ask, why are there so many people out of work when there are so many jobs in the classified section? Well, if you take a good look at the classified ads over the past few years, you will see one big difference. They've gotten a lot smaller. There are just fewer jobs out there. And for the unskilled, those people who make up the largest group of the unemployed, there's another big problem when searching for a job through the classifieds. Okay. Why are we seeing people getting jobs? Well, we can look in here okay. and see all kinds of you jobs. You see page column after, after page. column of clerical jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have good clerical skills, we can place you on a job. Any kind of health field, we can find you a job in 10 minutes. Sales, you'll find a lot of jobs for sale. Now, if you have skills, specific skills in particular demand occupations, you have no problem getting a job. Mm -hmm. If you don't have skills, you will have a problem. Keith Terrell, employment manager for Wometco Enterprises, says that international company does advertise jobs in the classifieds extensively. However, unskilled jobs are rarely submitted for publication because those jobs can be filled by walk-ins. And this is George Babbitt, labor market analyst for Florida State Employment Service. He receives calls from all over the country asking if Dade County is a good place to relocate to. The answer is both positive and negative. Years, since our population has been growing as well as 
the entire state of Florida, and we're affected by that also. The need for goods and services would increase. Naturally, your labor force would increase, as well as your employed persons. But the problem is that layoffs have outpaced new jobs. During the year bounded by Februarys in 1981 and 1982, the number of jobs dropped from 748,000 to 739,000 in Dade. A look at various industries show only one, health services, having an increase in employment during the February to February year. That due in part to South Florida having more people in need of health care, like the elderly. And while most industries show decreases over the year, manufacturing, the hotel industry, and local government did hire a total of 700 people during the month of February 1982. So overall, the employment picture is pretty bleak. And according to employment analyst Babbitt, it could be late fall before any change for the good occurs. First, we will have to get through this summer when 43,000 students will be in search of vacation employment. And good luck to you, okay? I'll be fine. Something good. Okay. Miami Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. We have uh, our senior U.S. Senator with us tonight, now completing his 12th year. Welcome to Montage, Senator Childs. Thank you, Joe. Nice been, to be on your program. It's been too long since I was in Washington, and we did a day in the life of, and I never forget the first Monday morning we were filming you, you were taking out the garbage for your wives, and I, I thought it was a very good experience that uh, we never, none of us, including myself, get too high in mind that we don't have to do <laughs> some of those. Uh, <laughs> no, that never changes, does it? <laughs> it does not indeed. Let's talk about South Florida for a minute. Why has there been the resistance in Congress to help defray the expenses of all the costs that the refugees have brought on South Florida in particular? I mean, I don't understand that. I would think that anybody in America would recognize that we have had a, an extraordinary burden put upon us. And I'm interested in the, the mindset of the people who have opposed that, or at least haven't made it easy for us to get reimbursed or, or helped. What, what's the thinking up there that we're missing? Well, it, uh, part of it is just that every day you're one day uh, more away from the national television on the Mariel boat lift. Uh, it's a day that the people that aren't from Florida say, hey, that's a local problem. Why don't you all handle that? Uh, you know, the Cubans have assimilated very well. They've helped your economy down there. That's something you can handle. And the second reason is the administrations have not helped us. And that's the biggest problem, because even where we've gotten the money, we found the administrations uh, through the OMB, and I say administrations because through the Carter and Reagan administration, right. dragging their feet uh, or not assisting us, and each time cutting the budget. See, if they had the money in in the budget to start with, and if they were assisting you, you wouldn't be fighting these other battles. But when you've got to put the money back in the budget and you've got to fight the administration, it's easier for Congress people who are saying, this doesn't do anything for my state. Yeah. You know, why should I be for it? Uh, it? It gives them the kind of excuse and it makes it harder that way. Let's talk about South America, Central America. Is there truly, in your mind, the growing threat of communism that, that must be dealt with, or are we just kind of overreacting to what's going on down there? Joe, I think we've got to deal with it. I think that uh, we're not overacting now. Uh, when I now hear people that come up to our country from Colombia, Costa Rica, Venezuela, now those are you know good, solid democracies that are down there. These aren't military governments. Uh, these are very viable democracies, and when they're saying, look, we're scared, we're worried, there are terrorists coming into our country. Here's Costa Rica, doesn't have an army, disbanded their army back in the early 50s. And, and how do they combat terrorists and guerrillas uh, that, that, that flow into there? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a very serious thing. I think that we've got to do something about it. And yet you have the Ed Asners uh, uh, holding a press conference in Washington and donating $25,000 and more to come to the, yeah. to the rebels in El Salvador. And I, what do they understand or think that, that people like yourself don't see? What, what well, I think we always get into this, uh, into the biggest problem that we have is that, you know, we don't get a government of our choosing down there. And even though I think Duarte wants to do the right thing, he's got a very repressive 
military who listens somewhat to a very strong right, you know, more in control mm -hmm. of the right. The uh, Tuvos, uh, the people that have, the, you know, run that country over the years, and they don't want to give up any control. They don't want any reform. And so dealing with that is very difficult because if they lose the support of the people, no matter how we try to, you know, prop yeah, them up, right. we won't be able to do it. So we get into that situation. On the other hand, uh, I think Abner and those people ought to look at who they're dealing with and the, the fact that uh, it's Castro-trained guerrillas out of Nicaragua and the kind of, uh, you know, acts of massacre and terrorism and that incredible. they're responsible for. It, and, you know, and we've seen the same thing happen uh, in, in, in other places. And I don't think you can play any ball with them either. Is it really a matter, though, of selfish U.S. interests that we want this to stay st stable? I mean, the cynics will say, oh, the United States doesn't really care. It's just in their best interest to have uh, now, strong I, repression I think government. this is getting too close to us. I think yeah. this is totally different from Vietnam. I think when you're now talking about uh, the possibility of the loss of uh, Colombia, Costa Rica, Venezuela, you know, Guatemala is next to Mexico. And uh, what's to say that, you know, that, that once this happens, uh, you know, if you had a turn of the government in Mexico, yeah. uh, that's on our common border. Yes. And so I think this is very much in our national interest. You think if we knew 20 years ago what we know now, we would have let Cuba remain uh, in, in, uh, so much under the wing of Russia? We would, don't you think we, I think we would have changed it and gone in and just got rid of it in the first Well, instance. I think we would have, or I think that we made a mistake in allowing Castro to sort of keep the build up and for us to be occupied somewhere else to say we're going to do something about it, we're going to do something about it. And let's, let's face it, he is violating all of the, uh, the Kennedy-Khrushchev agreements. Uh, you are not to introduce any offensive weapons. Uh, certainly those MiGs that are down there, certainly those attack helicopters, certainly, you know, the bear uh, mm -hmm. that is down there, those things are, are offensive in capability. And one of the other parts of that agreement that no one talks about now was, was, but was very clear at the time, he was not to export uh, revolution or terrorism. And my goodness, he's done that in Africa, he's done it in Central America. Uh, so we've clearly allowed him to get away with that. Now it makes it much more tougher uh, to call him to a halt because uh, we haven't done anything over the period of time. What kind of a temper do you get from the country? Well, from Florida. Let's talk about Florida. When you're traveling around, what's the mood as you perceive it today in Florida? Well, the mood was very, very strong down here that we've, uh, the federal government has abandoned us. It's given us these problems, uh, been part of the problem in immigration policy by their stands or their absence of their, uh, their yeah. policy. Uh, here we've got the, the, an invasion of drugs coming in here and the federal government is giving us uh, little or no assistance in that. Now, that very, very much was the mood. And then the, the sort of fear on the economy. Florida has not been affected as much by the recession as much of the nation. I think we, it's slower to hit here, plus the fact that we're in the Sun Belt where people have been moving in. So it was more uh, immigration and, and, uh, and crime. Uh, of course, a great destabilization on the part of the elderly. And, uh, what was going to happen with Social Security? Sure. I sense that we bottomed. Uh, on the crime situation. I really do. I think this community is coming to grips with that through establishing uh, its own, uh, you know, core of leadership. I think that came originally from the grassroots, uh, a neighborhood crime watch. Right. I think it started there, but now it's involved the leadership with the appointment of the task force, with the passage of some federal legislation that, uh, that I've been working on and some others have. I think we're turning the corner on that. There's a long way to go, but at least what I'm saying is we've bottomed out and, we're, and now if we can build the momentum, we can run these people out of here. Uh, immigration, I think, is, uh, certainly looks better. The interdiction prob uh, program right now is working. Uh, we're not seeing uh, people come on our shores, and we're beginning to come to grips with a, uh, a bill to give us a national policy on immigration. So I think those things are looking up. And I guess as we're out of time, you would uh, re reinforce my feeling that most of all, you should hear more from the constituents as to what they think and what they want so that you have a, an understanding of how the people are feeling, I, I guess. Oh, very much so. I, I think that's... Do you think you hear too much or not enough from us? No, I think the problem is that we stay in Washington uh, maybe longer than we should. We'd be better off if we had 
uh, to spend more of our time listening to the Well, listen, with that great bean soup you have in the Senate restaurant, I don't I can see why you stay in Washington all that time. Uh, well, the weather we've had up there, <laughs> I can tell you, I can see why all of my friends want to come to Florida. Great. So, well, you're always welcome here, Senator Childs. Great to see you again. Thank you, Jeff. Good being with you. We'll be right back. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Earlier in the program, I promised you a number to call if you want to help out the migrant workers in Palm Beach County. It's a Delray Beach phone number, 499-1297. Now that's long distance from Dade or Broward. Again, 499-1297. Next week on Montage, we'll see why a lot of people are upset about protections granted to accused criminals. Sometimes it seems at the expense of crime victims. We'll also see how inflation is changing the face of downtown Miami. That's our montage for this week. I'm Joe Abril. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, wow.